Hey, it's Paul from In 60 Days. So the book's available on Amazon, Cisco CCNA in 60 Days. It's version 4. Make sure you get the, the latest version. It's a bit cold here today, so I've got a hat on. If you notice anything different. Please subscribe to the channel so you see all the other videos. We upload a load of IT career videos and um, certification stuff. And hit the bell if you don't mind. Always there if you can, like the video and drop a comment. It really helps. So we're on to day 17 and it's routing protocols. Uh, read the cram guide obviously every day. Watch the videos of the day and do any labs I ask you to do. We'll be doing more and more labs as the course goes on. I know we haven't done too many so far, but it'll go from mostly theory to mostly labs. Go to subnetting.org and do the uh, practice questions or 101 labs IP subnetting. So today's routing basics video and then a routing protocols video. There's some books that will help you if you get a chance. They're on Amazon. Uh, Cisco CCNA Labs book is on version 4. So uh, without further ado, we'll go on to the videos. See you tomorrow. Welcome to our presentation on basic routing. So routing protocols. For the CCNA, you expected to understand a few fundamentals about how routing works, the routing table and the lookup process, and also how a packet is switched across an internet work. So the idea of routing protocols is to dynamically learn about networks. We've seen with static routes that there's no dynamic process taking place. The administrator determines which static routes are entered and those are hard-coded onto the router by the administrator and um, they don't change. So the idea is to exchange however the protocol works and uh, as you know each protocol works in a different way, a different format. They'll exchange information with other devices on the network. Now depending on the protocol, the routing protocol will exchange information internally with other devices or it will swap information about external networks. Now routing protocols do not send the data. They determine the best path for the data to go, but routed protocols actually are responsible for sending the data. So routed protocols, um, as I said, these get routed, they send the information. Now it does include IPX, which is now redundant really on pretty much every network. So IP is the only one we need to be concerned with. So as I said, routing is determining the best path for the traffic. Now, when we actually come to forward the packet, we have to do two things, determine the best path, which is the job of the routing protocols and actually send the packet. Now, whether, the, whether we're sending a frame or a packet, and the process is still called switching. So here's an example, a destination IP address matches a network on one of its directly connected networks. So a packet comes in and the router knows that this is a directly connected network. Checks the routing table and then forwards the packet. Now we've got an instance where a packet is received for a remote network. Again, the packet is destined for remote network, the routing table is checked, and if there's a route or a default route, then the packet is forwarded to the next top router. Now, if there is no default route and there's not, not a network in the routing table, then the packet will be dropped. That's the default behavior of routers. Obviously, they don't start sending broadcasts trying to find out where this other device is or who owns that IP address. Another classic exam uh, question is the change of the layer two headers when a frame is passed along a network. On the left hand side, we've got routers connecting with a serial connection using HDLC. And on the right hand side, it's a ethernet connection. So obviously the layer two header needs to change. The data obviously remains unchanged and the destination source and destination address. But the header obviously has to change because of the way the protocols work. Now, I've covered this elsewhere and I will be covering it also and reviewing it. But there's a, you need to bear in mind what does and does not change. The layer three 
uh, address, the IP address, does not change as the packet traverses the network. The reason is if that address changed, if the source address changed on route, then the packet would be lost because it wouldn't know where it was actually intended to go. So the information that does change in order for device, uh, devices to switch the packet between each other, the layer two source and address destination does change. So this enables the packet to be switched from device to device without the source and destination IP address changing. So here's a um, network topology I've put together and you could well come across um, a scenario like this in the exam. But basically host A is sending a packet uh, destined for host B and we've got the uh, layer 3 source address is uh, 192.168.1.1 which is the IP address of host A. Destination address is host B's address and then we've got the layer 2 source address which is the MAC address for host A. The destination address will be the next hop device, uh, which in this case is router 1. Now eventually, when the packet um, leaves router, to, router 2 for host B, the source and destination address has not changed, as I mentioned on the last slide. However, the layer 2 source address will be um, router 2's MAC address, and the source address, uh, destination address, will be host B's MAC address. So it's a very important point to understand for the exam. Admin distances. Um, Cisco iOS assigns a default value for all their routing information. Now for administrative distances, it can, it, the value can be anything from 0 to 255. The lower the number, the more reliable the router um, believes that route to be. So I've issued a show IP route on a router and you can see in the output, the, uh, I've highlighted in red the administrative distance. The cost will be the second number, uh, however that router determines the cost of the routing protocol. But for OSPF, the administrative distance is 110. It can be changed, however, that's beyond the um, boundaries of the CCNA. So routing uh, protocol algorithms, they use metrics, which are numerical values associated with specific routes. So the whole idea is the, pro the protocols will prioritize routes um, and decide which one is most preferred or least preferred. Lowest metric is the best, and the lowest metric will be the route installed in the routing table. There can be alternative routes with um, uh, higher metrics, uh, stored by the router, depending on the routing protocol. Now here's a list of administrative, administrative distances that you need to know by heart for the exam. So typical metrics you will come across uh, when you're configuring protocols for CCNA is bandwidth, which is the data rate on the line. The cost is a configured metric, so that can vary. Delay is the time it takes a packet to, to traverse. Load is the amount of traffic on the link. And the path length is the router or administrative system hops. An administrative system is a group of routers under the control of one administrative domain. And reliability. If a link is flapping, which means it's going up and down in rapid succession due to some sort of fault, then a, a penalty, a cost penalty, can be applied to that link. And prefix matching is a, another thing um, you need to know about, and I, uh, it is in the syllabus as well for the ICND1. So the longest prefix or most specific route would be used to route traffic. I'll let you read the rest. But uh, we're going to cover an example now. So don't get confused because administrative distance is the most believable route. But, but, but first, the priority will be given to the longest match prefix. So here we have a uh, route learned by RIP, which is you can see after the highlighted part has got administrative distance that's quite high, is 120. 
ERGRP has learned a route to the 80 network, however it's a slash 8, so the prefix is shorter. And you can see the administrative distance is 90 for ERGRP. We've got an OSPF external route which has got a prefix of 16 bits slash 16. The administrative distance is 110. Now the router, because of the longest um, match rule, will always choose the RIP learned route. So this is reiterating what I said on the last slide. So a, pa a packet destined for address 1.1.1.1 and you can see we've got different prefix, prefixes and the order that they will be used by the router. Classful and classless networks, routing. Classful protocols cannot use VLSM. Um, these aren't actually tested in the CCNA, however they may ask you about the difference between classful and classless. So RIP and IGRP do not understand the concept of VLSM. So the problem is they will just send, if you have a network added to RIP, for example, version 1, it will just send the um, network information but not the subnet mask. It will, do, it will presume the default subnet mask is applied. So class less protocols use VL, VLSM and examples are RIP version 2 and ERGRP. And on a debug, you can see the network address and the subnet mask has been sent in the update. So the routing table, which you'll be seeing a lot as you do the labs, it lists a network of routes. It shows how the route was learned, the administrative distance and the cost, and the next hop address to reach that network. It also shows the status um, of the route, including the last update and the exit interface. So here's a show IP route on a router that's running several routing protocols. I've highlighted the information that I mentioned in the, the last slide. And here's some more explanations of the routing fields. OSPF external for this particular um, line I chose, the network or host, administrative, administrative distance and the cost, which IP address the route was learned by, how old the entry is, 21 minutes, 26 seconds in this case, and the next hop address is serial 0 slash 1. So in order to route, IP routing command needs to be enabled on routers. It's enabled by default on all routers with modern um, versions of iOS. Um, on layer 3 switches, if you're using a routing function, then you need to type the command IP routing or you may spend a long time, as I have, trying to troubleshoot problems. The router must obviously know the destination or the next hop address. Exit interface or next hop must actually be valid and exist. If it's connected, send it'll be sent to that interface. If it's not connected, check the routing table. Routing protocols. So for the older version of the CCNA, you weren't really tested on this, so it was just presumed you had a, a certain amount of knowledge of what we're going to discuss. However, to reflect the new changes in the CCNA exam, we're going to cover some fundamental routing concepts and in particular distance vector versus link state. And some of the things I think they could be asking in the exam particularly from, um, well, my own experience in the exam, feedback from students, and also looking at what's in the syllabus and what um, what's new wasn't, wasn't there before. So routing protocols, uh, a definition is it's a language shared by routers in order for them to exchange network reachability information. Routing protocols do a few things really, path determination, responsible for route update, sending and receiving, working out the next hop if the best path to a certain network isn't available, can it store, depending on the protocol, can it store another route, does it have a topology table, uh, and how does it deal with, with these issues. Also dealing with topology changes, if a certain part of the network becomes unavailable, can it find another way to get there. 
two major classes you need to be aware of distance vector and link state and the the different way both work convergence basically is when all routes or routers agree on the map or the topology of the network so all routing tables should agree on what the network looks like and how to reach all the various parts of it Blown balancing is a concept that's now included in the CCNA syllabus. Load balancing is basically distributing traffic load to the same destination, but taking different paths. So, for example, you could have routers A and B, and obviously you've got two paths to get to the same um, source and destination. One of the paths may be a high bandwidth, one may be a low bandwidth. So depending on your router protocol, routing protocol, does it automatically distribute the load between the faster and the slower path, for example, 80% to 20%? Does it choose the faster path only? Or, or um, with the older protocols, does it choose the least hops, which then may not take into account the fact that one of the, one of the routers is running on a slow speed lin link? ERGRP is actually Cisco proprietary, so you just need to be aware of the fact that it's got elements of link state protocol and elements of distance vector, but it's neither one nor the other. For its metrics, it uses distance, so unlike a link state, for example OSPF, it doesn't use cost. It does send periodic updates, and I'm going to show you a table later on so you can compare all of the protocols. It doesn't use link states for advertisements. The algorithm was actually um, developed by this person here. I don't think you'd be asked that in the exam, but it, I just wanted to demonstrate it. It doesn't use the same algorithm as distance vector or link state. Now, distance vector protocols use what is known as the Bellman for forward algorithm. They do send periodic routing updates no matter what's happened on the network, even if there has or hasn't been a change. Regular updates are sent if the route changes also. Different protocols do this in different ways. They use uh, vectors of distance and direction. The vector for distance is hops and the vector for direction is a next hop router. So vectors are just a way of measuring our, our paths. So for every X seconds, whatever it may be for the protocol, or if you've configured it differently, the router broadcasts its entire routing table. Now these broadcasts are received by other routers and then forwarded on, which is where we get the concept routing by rumor. Now it does exclude um, issues that we come across, including split horizon and hold down, routes that routes are in hold down state, which I'll come to shortly. It does include uh, the metrics for routes also. The adjacent routers compare the routes received to the routes installed on the routing table and the topology table, if it has one. Best routes are stored in the routing table, obviously. The adjacent router sends out its routing table and this process continues however many seconds the routing protocol is configured to do so. And two examples of distance vector are RIP and IGRP. So features of distance vector are periodic full routing updates. The updates are sent to neighbors on the link. Broadcasts are used to find neighbors and update routes. Um, I've covered in other lectures the IP addresses, the multicast addresses used. And you can see RIP which I've got configured here and the show IP protocols sends updates every 30 seconds and it's running a timer so it knows the next one is due in eight seconds time. Now in validation timers a router can actually degrade the value of a route and the value resets each time a route is received so this is a form of protecting route updates on the network and you can see for RIP just for example the invalid timer, the route becomes invalid after 180 seconds if no update is received. Split horizon, the concept is, is to prevent the same route going out of the interface from the, the same network to go out of the same interface that it was learned from. So this is basically to prevent routing loops. 
The problem you have is on certain network topologies where you've only got one interface, say for example here you've got a multipoint interface or a natural interface, you've got a route that comes in from the 192.168 network, but it can't be advertised out of the same interface because it breaches the split horizon rule. Now there are commands that will in enable you to allow split horizon or disallow split horizon, turn it off, and the command there varies depending on which protocol you're configuring. Maximum hot count is a feature to prevent a packet traveling forever on the network, which is known as counting to infinity. So for example, on RIP, the, there's a hop count which counts down all the way, the maximum is 16, but once the router, once the packet gets to the 15th router, then it's um, terminated. You can see here a RIP route, the value is 120 administrative distance, and it's one hop away. If it was um, 15, then it, that would be the final hop before the, pack, the packet was no longer allowed to traverse the network. Poison reverse, the idea behind this is to advertise a route, but the route is actually unreachable, and it's used in conjunction with split horizon to prevent the route being sent out of the same interface. Hold down timers are blocking routes which were valid from appearing in the routing table. The idea behind this is to, if there's a problem with network stability or instability, the hold down timer as it counts should allow the route to stabilize. You can see the hold down timer for RIP is 180 seconds. Triggered updates is when the metric for a particular route changes for better or for worse. The update is sent before the time expires. So this allows our routing table to have a fresher route for a particular network. If we wait until 30 seconds, for example, that means we could have up to 30 seconds of our packets going into black holes or suboptimal routing, which is what we don't want. Link state works in a different way. Uh, I think the pronunciation is distra algorithm. They do support VLSM and they actually form neighbor relationships. Depending on the protocol, there's different requirements for the neighbor relationship to form, such as uh, timers and passwords and autonomous system numbers. It just depends on the protocol you're using. Non-stub routers, which uh, non-stub routers are routed with only one path in or out to it, to another router. Non-stub routers see all paths to all networks. As the event triggered updates, the link state protocols, all, all routers create a link state database and they do uh, all require a hierarchical topology, which I'll go into. So the point be behind hierarchical design is uh, before the network is actually implemented, implemented, the design takes place to have the most efficient network addressing. So if the router is summarizing, it doesn't cause uh, black holes on the network. If you've got a discontiguous network, then it's, it basically requires more routing updates and you're introducing possible uh, routing issues. Reduces routing overhead, speeds up convergence, and if there is instability on a certain part of the network, because it's hierarchical, it's confined to a, that particular area. So link state routing, adjacency is formed with a neighbor. Link state advertisements are sent to neighbors. The link state advertisements include the route, the cost, and any neighbors. All link state advertisements are forwarded to, to neighbors and they're stored in the link state database. So your link state database is a map of the entire network. From this database, then the shortest path is calculated and the shortest path is then placed into the routing table. So neighbor discovery is the first step in the, our link state networking. Hello packets, in order for this to work, must contain at the very minimum the router ID. Databases are synchronized between the routers and neighbors obviously must be adjacent to each other, to one another. So I've put a table just so you're aware of the differences between static and dynamic and also the features and benefits. One is not necessarily better than the other, it just depends on your network topology and requirements and they've all got their pros and cons. 
So for example, on our network here, really there probably wouldn't be any point in you running dynamic routing protocols at all. The headquarters router can advertise a summary route out to the web router. The web router has just got a next hop address to send any traffic to its ISP. If that 10 network was routable, which obviously it isn't, then the web router could also send out a, a, a default route or a summarized route to the, for that particular network out to the ISP. And finally, I've put a comparison here of a true distance vector, which is RIP version 2, just you've got one to see, and it's a administrative distance, ERGRP, in brackets up at five, in case so you know that um, summary routes for ERGRP have a, distant, a different administrative distance, and OSPF. So it's worth you looking at this and then probably remembering all the, the various values and how each one works as compared to the other.